welcome to Elements. Through the miracle of technology, I'm actually able to pre-record this and be with you guys even though I'm a thousand miles away in Mexico. So um, I'm thankful, thankful that, uh, that we can continue to, to do this through technology and I hope this works well tonight. If not, we'll never do it again and we will just uh, do other things. But anyway, we had such a great Sunday, uh, such a blessing in English and in Spanish. I'm so thankful for all that God is doing and I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful that these people that, that we call Coast Church are our family, the family of God, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're here for one another. We support one another. We pray for one another. It's a blessing. And tonight we are going to jump into elements and we are in element number four and uh, element 4.3 in particular. And that is the element of the fruit of the spirit. And the focus element tonight is to walk in newness of life and not succumb to our selfish nature, we must keep in step with the Spirit. And we want to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit shows that we have the Spirit and the Spirit is not only something we received years ago, but it's something that is active in our life. And I don't know about you, but I, I, it just makes sense to me. If there's no root, there's no fruit. We have to grow roots in order for fruits to grow. And so we want to be rooted and grounded in God's word and God's spirit in our life, rooted. That's why we've been talking about the mental game, the mind game we've been talking about on Sundays. We want to be rooted so that we can produce fruit. Every Christian should be producing something beautiful in their lives. That's what God's intention is for you. And so we're going to talk about those fruit tonight, and I want to open it up uh, with a word of prayer, and then we're going to turn to the video of Pastor Scott Graham, one of my favorite preachers, by the way, an incredible man of God, Pastor Scott Graham. He's going to share something with us uh, from the Elements video, but let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight. We thank you for this beautiful setting that you've given us. We thank you for this church, and I thank you right now, Lord, for all of the fruit of the Spirit that is is growing. God, we see joy. We see faith. We see the goodness of God working in people's patience with one another. God, uh, you've been so good to us. Thank you for the spirit that is in us. Thank you for baptizing us with your Holy Ghost and fire and the fruit that grows out of it. God, we thank you tonight. Be with us, Lord. Let this Bible study be relevant and practical for our lives. Let it be real. Let it be something that we hide deep in our hearts, Lord. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. A friend of mine who pastored in Missouri some years ago related to me an incident that occurred in the life of his father. His dad lived in rural Missouri, a little farm, and up his driveway, he planted some apple trees. He did that with the anticipation, of course, that in coming falls, he would enjoy all the bounty of those trees, apple cake, apple sauce, apple fritters, all those things that are so good. And most, for the most part, it worked. His trees began to bear over the years. But there was one tree. It was by far the biggest, the best looking, the most full branches, the foliage, everything about that tree screamed that it would be the one he could expect to fulfill his wishes from. But the most amazing thing as the years went by, that tree didn't produce any of these. Not one apple was ever hanging on its branches. It had no explanation. It looked healthiest, it was the largest, grew well, it looked beautiful, it just didn't produce any apples. He called an expert from the University of Missouri, a horticulturalist, a man who had knowledge in agriculture, and he came out to look this situation over. He pulled up, he looked things over, he reached into the back of his truck, and he pulled out about a five or six foot length of chain, heavy log chain, and proceeded to do what seemed unthinkable. He began to beat that tree with that chain, gouging chunks of bark off the trunk, knocking entire branches off, foliage littered the ground. The old farmer began to try to intervene. You're gonna kill it. And the man just kept wailing on that tree with that chain. Before very long, that poor tree looked like it had survived some terrible storm. It was battered and bruised and wounded. When he got done with that, he dropped the chain back in his pickup truck, looked at the old farmer and said, well, that ought to do it. The old man said, I don't understand what's going on here. You've killed that tree. He said, no, I didn't kill it. He said, sir, the problem was that tree got so busy looking good that it forgot this was its purpose. 
He said, you'll see. My friend told me the next year his dad related to him that that tree was weighted down with apples. It bore more fruit than any of the other trees up and down that lane. It's an amazing lesson probably to be learned in there. God calls you and I as his children to bear fruit. That's what we're supposed to do. It's really not so much about us looking good, having all the right foliage of a Christian so our neighbors will be impressed just with how we look. The question is, are we bearing fruit? And when we fail in that, God has a way of bringing us back to our purpose. Sometimes that's painful. Sometimes it wounds us. But this is what God wants from us. Bearing the fruit of the Spirit is what we're supposed to accomplish. So in these lessons, we're going to take a look at the fruit of the Spirit, understand a little more about what they are, what they mean, how they apply themselves, and how they demonstrate themselves in our lives. But just remember, knowing about them, being able to recite them, looking good on paper, that's not the quest. This is what he wants. The clip that we've just watched reminds us of the importance of bearing fruit in our lives. And thankfully, Scripture gives us a wealth of instruction on how to do just that. The book of Galatians in the Bible addresses this topic of the fruit of the Spirit. And today, we're going to look specifically at the Word of God to learn what it has to say about this foundational element of our spiritual lives. First, we'll explore how vital it is to keep in step with the Spirit so we don't succumb to our selfish nature. We'll discuss how every believer must make ongoing, conscious choices to put down our selfish desires and to submit to the desires of the Spirit of God. Finally, we're going to celebrate that when we walk in the Spirit, God ultimately fills our lives with a selfless love for Him and for other people. It's time now to look to God's Word and discuss this together. Feel free today to ask any questions that you might have. And after this session is over, when you go home this week, spend some time in prayer and take some time to review the Bible passages that are listed in your participants' guide. God bless you today as you seek to be led by His Spirit. So if you hear some footsteps coming around here, that is uh, that's a little Quinny girl, my dog. She's walking around here. She's having a good time. Oh, she wants to be on the video. She don't get to come to church very much, so say hi, Quinn. Say hi. Hi to the Coast family. She loves everybody. She loves church. She loves coming to church and running around. So if you ever see her, that's, uh, that's Quinn. Let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, in the first part of your book, you will find uh, the, the first part that says the fruit of the Spirit. And it says each of us will either do the works of the flesh, what we want to do, or produce the fruit of the Spirit, what the Spirit wants to do. And if you notice, it has an uppercase S, a big S there, and that means that it is His Spirit, not our Spirit. Anytime you see lowercase S, that is the Spirit of man. Uh, uppercase S, that's the Holy Spirit. That's God's Spirit, what He wants to do in us. And so you have this war of Am I going to do what I want to do and what I'm selfish about, or am I going to do what God wants me to do? The fruit of the Spirit is doing, producing what God wants us to produce. Every believer must make ongoing, continual, conscious choices to put down the desires of the flesh and to submit to the desires of the Spirit. And the natural result of walking in the Spirit is seen in the fruit of our lives. It's seen in how we grow. And so I want somebody to read for me Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Do I have a volunteer? Okay, sister, no, I'm, brother, I'm not there, so I can't tell. But uh, somebody volunteer and um, join in and read Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16 through 25. All right, I have a couple questions for you. So, first and foremost, in verse 16 through 17, what are the two elements that strive against each other to control our lives? What are those two elements? And you can hit pause again. You guys are going to be quick on that remote. Hit pause again, and why don't you find somebody that will answer those two questions? This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so you have the Spirit and the flesh. And God is calling us to walk in 
the Spirit. It's easy to be distracted, to find things that we get lustful about, but God is calling us to be walking in the Spirit. Is the fruit of the Spirit singular or plural? And what does that mean? Well, let's look at verse 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So you have these nine fruits. And some people say, well, what about the gifts of the Spirit? We talked about that already a few weeks ago. The gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit, I believe, uh, the best way I've heard it described is they, wor they work like, uh, like wings of a bird, right? You think of bird wings. I don't know if those are very good, but um, if one is flapping and the other one's not working, you're just going to go around in circles and you're going to get frustrated. But when they are flapping together, fruit of the Spirit, work, gifts of the Spirit, when they are working together, you are a high-flying Christian. You are a high uh, capacity. You, God is using you in a mighty way. And that's why we need these things to get to work together. Because we now have life in the Spirit, what are we commanded to choose to do daily in the Spirit? Well, let's look at verse 25. It says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So if we are going to be Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost filled believers, we've got to walk in the Spirit. We've got to walk how Jesus wants us to walk. How does he want us to walk? Read the Gospels. Read the Sermon on the Mount. Read Proverbs. Read Psalms. Read, read the Scripture. It is completely filled with instructions on how God wants us to walk as his children. And so we want to make sure that those are active in our life. Now let's dive into some of the fruits of the Spirit. The first three, I would bunch them together, and that's love, joy, and peace. I don't know about you, but uh, is there anybody that just would agree with me and say, you know, the world could use a lot more love, joy, and peace, <laughs> especially right now. We could use a lot more of this. And so uh, we want to focus in on those. So let's jump into those. Somebody read for me Romans chapter 5 and verse number 5. Who wants to read that? Okay. So Romans 5 and 5, what is the source of love in a Christian's life? Well, let's look at it together. It says that hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That's why we preach about the Holy Ghost at Coast Church, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, just like they did in the book of Acts. Now, I know there's people that don't believe like, oh, well, the Holy Ghost is, they, they believe something like this. The Holy Ghost is just something that you get in your mind once you believe in Jesus. Um, well, that, that's not really what happened when we see in the book of Acts. Cornelius' house, they were believers. Um, they, they were believers. They were, they were fallen, but they had not received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 19, you read the same thing. And so we got to understand that we need the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm not talking about tongues and, and uh, interpretation. I'm talking about speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives us the utterance, that initial gift of the Holy Ghost. We need that. Otherwise, the fruit of love will not grow because we don't really have the Spirit. And what is the source of joy and peace in the Christian's life? Well, let's read that in Romans 14 and 17. Romans 14 and 17. I feel like I'm just right there with you guys tonight. This is, this is kind of cool. I, I keep looking at the camera, but I'm really, I'm looking around the cafe. I'm looking around the room. Romans 14 and 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not things that you can touch, tangible things, but it's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. These are things that the Spirit works, the things that you cannot see but you can sense and you can feel and you know them in your spirit. And so how can we increase and deepen our love and our joy and our peace in our lives? How can we do that? I mean, if, you, if anybody wants to jump in, you can pause us right now. If there's hands that are going up, we can pause us right now and take some thoughts. But if nobody wants to answer, I'll jump in and just say, 
get the Holy Ghost active in your life. Paul told Timothy, he said this, stir up the gift that is in you by the laying on of hands. Stir up that gift. We, we want God to stir us up, but we've got to pray. You know what? God, I'm not waiting for you to stir me up. I'm not waiting for the sermon, the message, the pastor, uh, some visiting minister, some song that I like the most. I'm not waiting for that to stir. I got to stir the gift of the Holy Ghost up inside of me. It is on me. And it's what we talked about Sunday, winning the war in your mind. You got to confront some things and understand I've got to do it. If the fruit of the spirit is going to grow in my life, it starts with the Holy Ghost. Joy is translated uh, as a part of the fruit of the spirit. It really is defined as a calm delight. I like that definition, a calm delight. It's where you're going through your world and, and there could be bombs going off around you, but there is a calm, tranquil delight inside of you that you know Hey, I just, I, I just talked to Jesus. I just spent time in the Holy Ghost praying. And this is a beautiful day. This is a day the Lord has made. I will rejoice in it, no matter what's going on around me. Peace uh, means a tranquility or a quietness. Now, I believe that, that that can be physical, but it can also be spiritual as well. That, that tranquility, that quietness of our spirit means when everything's loud around us, we don't have to match the tone of the world, but we can walk in tranquility and quietness inside of our spirits. It, it also carries a connotation of healing. When you have peace, it's because God has healed open wounds. It's, it's hard to be at peace when you're hurting, right? But when you are healed, you can have peace. And uh, so uh, joy and peace. We know what love is. Love is, is simply, uh, we describe it as this, God is love. And we understand the scripture gives us many definitions of what love is. Greater, greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend. Uh, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave. So we understand that love is an action Verb. It is a, a word of action and we get involved with love. We don't just say we love our brother. We love our brother. We don't just say we love our sister. We love our sister. It is an action word. And I know a lot of people are, oh, well, that's works, Pastor Scott. Well, faith without works is dead. And the scripture said that I didn't say that. So don't say you love me without actually working to get to know me. Don't say you love me without actually working together with me. People use the word love so flippantly. Oh, I love this pizza. I'm like, do you really love this pizza? Um, are you willing to lay down your life for that pizza? I don't think so. I think love should be a word that we esteem very highly. All right, let's move on to the next, uh, the next module or, or the next point in the module, long suffering, gentleness, and goodness. So, um, read with me, if you will, uh, Colossians three and verse 12. And then 2 Timothy 2 and verse 24 and Titus verse chapter 2 and verse 7. And uh, you can find somebody to read these or I will read them for you. All right. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 says this. It says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. So that's what we are supposed to put inside of us so that we can dispense it or give it to others around us. We're supposed to have this, this spirit of mercy and kindness and humility of mind and meekness and long suffering. That's patience. Those are the things that God wants us to have. We're to choose to put on long suffering because we are what? What, what does it say we, we are? Because we are the elect of God. We're called to live holy, different than this world. So we should act different than this world. Uh, the fill-ins on this one say, the next three aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And yielding to the work of the Spirit in our lives results in patience, kindness, and integrity. This spiritual fruit does not result from our attempts at behavioral modification. They are the natural manifestation of God's transformative work in our life. It's not you're just changing your behavior. It's I've been changed by God. I'm not changing this. I've been changed. God did something miraculous in my life. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, let's read it. It says, And the servants of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. 
So to whom should we be gentle? To other Christians only? To just our neighbor on one side? It says to all men. So we should be gentle to everyone. And then Titus uh, 2 and verse 7. Um, our good works should be seen in everything and they will glorify God. So we want to yield to the Spirit and let these fruit grow in our lives. Long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. Let's define each and every one of these terms. So long-suffering, um, really that is simply the word patience. God's kingdom is not always immediate. Uh, a lot of times we're in a moment of crisis and we pray and we cry out to God, do it now, Lord, do it now. And he doesn't do it now. So what do we do? Do we freak out? Do we get upset? Um, do we cry and throw a fit like a, like a little baby? No, no, no. We keep going to the Lord. We have what's called importunity. We keep knocking on the door in prayer. Why? Because we have the fruit of patience in our life. Gentleness. Now, the word uh, gentle lets us know that we have this calm spirit of a shepherd, just like Jesus had, right? This gentle spirit. Proverbs 15 and 1 says this. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. When you're gentle in your words, when you're gentle with people, it, it, it calms things down. But when you are using grievous words, angry words, it actually stirs the pot even more. And God is not blessing pot stirs. God is not blessing drama queens. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. That is the works of the flesh. And so we don't want that. We want the gentleness that God gives us. And let's look at the last one, goodness. Goodness speaks of an internal moral and ethical purity. Uh, something that is demonstrated in our interactions with the world. They can be good in alignment with God. They, they can be good and, and out of God's goodness and according to his word. Now, if there are actions that you're doing in your life and you keep feeling ugly about doing them, uh, you need to go to prayer in those things and ask God, is this the fruit of goodness growing in my life? Is this fruit, is it actually growing well, why do I feel this, God? And maybe God is trying to get a, a weed that's or a vine that's trying to tangle and starve that fruit of goodness out. Maybe he's trying to get you to see something that is not goodness in your life, and he wants to remove that and help you with that. All right, let's look at the final four or the final uh, three in, in number four. It says faith, meekness, and temperance. The final three aspects of the fruit of the Spirit are faith, meekness, and temperance. Those are your feelings. And this fruit results in a consistency. Once again, the fruit of the Spirit are consistently, just like the fruit on trees around us, they grow every single year. Every year, they just keep producing fruit. And that's what God wants to do in your life. Uh, this fruit results in a consistency, a measured strength, and control of our desires. When we are led by His Spirit and when we walk in His Spirit, Spirit, by the very nature of that submission, God's power directs us in the process of corralling our base desires and rendering them helpless to harm. In other words, we take the base desires, the lowest desires of man, and we corral them. We, we crucify them, is what, what the scripture really says. We give, we sacrifice them to God and say, I'm answering to a higher power. Therefore, I should live at a higher level. So read with me uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25. Hebrews Hebrews 11 and verse 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to, to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith it is impossible to do what? Simple answer. You can't please God without faith. You can't even come close to him, let alone please him. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 4. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4 says, But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. God values 
that meek and quiet spirit. I admire that in people. I don't admire uh, the, the, the kind of religion that gets angry at people. And uh, I'm not talking about yelling and, and, and getting emotional. We do that in the pulpit. I get fired up in, in, when I'm preaching the gospel, and, and that's okay. But I'm talking about angry and pointing fingers of condemnation and wrath and the one that sits in the seat of the scornful, like, you know, like the scripture says. And, and so we want to make sure that we have the hidden man of the heart uh, growing the fruit of meekness. And that is the kind of spirit that is precious in God's sight. He values that and he wants that to be growing in your life. All right. The final scripture we're going to read tonight is 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25. Turn there with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25. Hope everybody is enjoying this tonight and getting a lot out of it. I know that these will bless you as God's Spirit is working in you and convicting you of things. You may not have ever thought of them before. So some people ask the question, how do I know that I'm changing? And well, people around you will tell you, number one. But number two, you'll feel a conviction over things you used to do, words you used to say, places you used to go, things you used to wear, uh, mindsets that you used to have, conversations, jokes you used to tell. And when you say, Oh, that's, that's kind of a dirty joke. That, that was like my best joke. Everybody laughed at that joke, but I feel dirty. I feel convicted about it. That's supernatural. That's the Holy Spirit ministering to you and telling you, hey, I want the fruit of goodness to grow in your life. And goodness can't grow where there's badness. Badness equals sadness. You can't grow good fruit where there's badness. It, it poisons the good. How do I know that? Well, the scripture says that, 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 that there's not a spring of water that gives bitter water and sweet water. Um, they, they understood this. They would go to different springs and, and nobody in the Old Testament would say, oh, the water is really sweet today. Oh, it's really bitter tomorrow. Or, you know, it, it doesn't produce. It either produces one kind of water or the other. And so you can't have goodness and evil growing in the same place. And so uh, we want to have the meekness of the Lord. Uh, let's read 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. And now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And so what Paul is talking about, that everyone that in this world, whether they're craftsmen with their hands, whether they're a professional athlete, whether they are a top hotshot lawyer or doctor or dentist or the, somebody that's the best at their field, they use temperate or, or, or temperance, which, which means they are, they are honed in, they are dialed in and focused and, and, and they're really, they're, they're hardened by, uh, in, in a good way towards a goal. And they do that for something that is corruptible, right? So something that's temporary, being the best in your field, making a lot of money. Well, that money's going to go and be gone when you're dead. Um, but we have temperance for something that is an incorruptible crown, a crown that we of righteousness that we are going to put on our, on our heads and we are going to be in heaven with our Lord and Savior and we're going to rejoice with Him and, and we're going to be able to do that because we were temperate. Uh, being temperate in all things is a key to receiving an incorruptible crown. So let's define these last few terms. Number one, faith. We kind of know what faith is, right? Um, faith, it's, it's impossible uh, to please God. Um, and without faith, we, we can't please Him. We can't even come close to Him. Faith is believing before seeing. So believing something is going to happen before putting all your trust in God to see something happen before you ever see any sign of it. It's the, the uh, faith is the evidence of things hope for, or the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you can believe and have evidence of something that you don't see. And uh, that's a fruit of the spirit and your faith should be grown faith to faith. All right. Meekness. Um, Meekness is not weakness. I want you to know that. And, uh, and, and men, a lot of times, will struggle with this. But men, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is controlled strength. I will never forget, I was watching a, um, 
just a, a interview with somebody and they were talking about uh, how their opponent was so loud and boisterous. And, and they said, did that play into uh, the way that you do things? And this person says, you know, uh, and they were so meek about their answer. They say, you know, I just know what I'm about and I know what, what I'm doing in my life. And, uh, and I know the training I've put in for this. And, uh, and I'm not worried about what they say. In other words, it's a controlled strength. And, and let me ask you this. Do you respect the person that's yelling and, and always just, you know, like a little chihuahua, just always talking about what they're going to do, blah, 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 blah. Or do you respect the, the German shepherd that's quiet over in the corner, but you know is way more powerful than the chihuahua? I, I don't know about you, but I'm going to give a little more respect to that German shepherd that's over there that has that quiet, controlled strength. And finally, temperance really is self-control. It's a hardening of the will in a good way, not a calloused way, but in a good way, a hardening of the will. It's a final aspect of the fruit of the Spirit and it speaks firmly of reigning in your selfish, sinful nature. Reigning in it and say, oh, I'm tempted by this, but God, I know you're working in me and I know the Holy Ghost is helping me to overcome this temptation right now. And I want to see the fruit of the Spirit growing. Um, th this is what we understand, what the scripture says, that they will see your good works and they'll glorify God. And so when we have the fruit of the spirit, we will do good things in our community. We will do things in our family. And that th those good things that are growing out of us will impact others around us. People will say there's something different about those people, those, those apostolic Pentecostal believers that are filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, yeah, I know that they, they believe in all that speaking in tongues. But not only that, but there's something growing and something real in their life. Let me say this. Don't speak in tongues on Sunday and go and tear down your sister on Monday. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. I don't care how long you spoke in tongues on Sunday. The fruit of the Spirit isn't growing. It isn't growing. And so we want to make sure that we are working with the, the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. We want to fly together for the Lord. And in closing discussion, um, we just want to make sure that these lessons are being applied to our life. Don't just hear them say, oh, that was a great lesson. Man, even on video, it was good tonight. Don't, don't just say that, but, but pray and ask God. And as we close out, we're going to pray and ask God to say, Lord, let these things grow in my life. And if there's an area of one of them that has maybe been choked out, God, maybe I haven't been as patient with my family as I need to. God, maybe, uh, maybe I need to think more about goodness in my life and I'm allowing evil to creep in through media, social media, videos, movies, whatever, music. Uh, and I'm allowing, maybe I need to cut that out and let goodness grow up in its place. And so let's pray as we close out. Lord Jesus, we thank you for speaking to us through your word once again. And we understand, Lord, this fruit of the Spirit is not just changing our behavior. It's not just modifying our behavior and trying to do these things on our own. But there is something powerful and enabling from your Holy Ghost, your Holy Spirit that is working inside of us that gives us the power to do these things that we couldn't do before, to have these mindset shifts that we couldn't have before. And we give you the glory for it. We give you the praise for it. It is by grace through faith. We know that it is nothing that we have done, but it's because of what you've done. You have poured your spirit into us. You have given us the power, not, not of, uh, you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And so we thank you for that. Let us walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and let the fruit of the spirit grow in our life. Reveal these things to us. We pray father in the name name of Jesus Christ tonight. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go with you. Hey, I'll be back Sunday. So we'll see everybody on Sunday. It's going to be a great week. Keep letting the fruit of the spirit grow in your life. God bless you.